Uh, my name is Leo Dirac, and I'm going to talk to you about training neural networks and try to impart some uh, geometric intuition, some, some visual reasoning. Now, uh, for me, when I'm working through these kinds of problems, I find it's a lot easier to uh, reason about what's going on if I can have a picture in my mind of what's going on with the data, and that tends to work for me much better than staring at equations. And I know everybody's different, but uh, this really works for me. Uh, so I'm going to try and give you a sense of what training a neural network looks like. Uh, and so the way we're going to do this is going to just give some context on what supervised learning means. And uh, so we're all on the same page and can share vocabulary. Then dive into uh, what that looks like uh, for a deep net as opposed to a simple linear model that we'll start with. Uh, and then show you how to apply these ideas in code. Uh, so to start out with, we're going to do supervised learning on uh, on a basic linear uh, uh, linear problem. Now, uh, who remembers the movie Moneyball uh, or or read the book? Right. So the idea was they were going to use big data to figure out who was going to be a uh, great baseball player uh, and uh, find some bargains. Right. And nowadays, I think we'd call that a machine learning problem. So we're going to talk about ML ball. And so some of you may be uh, seen this uh, example that I've used before, uh, but the, uh, uh, the idea is that we're going to learn this function f, which is the model, uh, which processes some input data to try to predict some outcome, some, uh, some kind of prediction. And in this case, the input data is uh, stats and information about some promising young player uh, that we're wondering if that player is going to end up being a great player later on in their career. And because this is math, uh, what we have to do is we have to take all that information about the player and convert it into a bunch of real numbers, D real numbers, D features, and combine these as a vector, uh, which is just a list of numbers, right? And then we try to predict another number on the outside, which is some number zero to one about how great that player is, or minus infinity to infinity, doesn't really matter, right? We need some scale for it. So we can use just about anything we want uh, that we think might be useful uh, to predict here and uh, turn that into a vector. And for example purposes, because I want to be drawing pictures and, and give you some uh, visual intuition, I'm just going to pick two, which is speed and strength. Right? So we measure how fast they are on the 100 meter dash, how strong they are on a bench press, and we can plot it all out. And so every one of these points represents a human being, right? a baseball player. And let's say these are all real professional players, so then we can annotate this data uh, by color based on how much money they actually earned when they were playing uh, in, say, megabucks. And we see the yellow points are better, the blue points not as good, and we can see that there's a trend line going up and uh, to the left where the better players are unsurprisingly faster and stronger. And we use this uh, trend line to learn a decision boundary, which is this red dotted line, and the idea of this decision boundary is that everything on the left of it is somebody we would want to hire, and everything on the right of it is somebody we wouldn't. And we can slide this thing back and forth uh, to be more or less picky about the, the people that we uh, end up hiring. Right? And the, the, uh, on a simple problem like this, with only two dimensions and a pretty clear data set, we can eyeball the pattern reasonably well. But uh, for a more complex data set where you're using machine learning, uh, I like to say one of the things machine learning can do is to find patterns in data that humans can't because they're too complex or they're too subtle and a human being can stare at the data even with tools till, till they're, they're blue in the face and they wouldn't find the pattern. And so a standard way for a machine to find this decision boundary is SGD, Stochastic Gradient Descent. Uh, and the way it works very roughly is it picks some random decision boundary, it uh, doesn't really matter, and then it measures the mistakes and it quantifies all of them. And then it tweaks that decision boundary to reduce the number of mistakes and it repeats over and over again until you end up not making any changes and it's, uh, it's pretty good, right? So that's the idea. So what does it look like? What does it look like when you're running SGD? So uh, to do that, I'm gonna use a, uh, a much smaller, simpler data set. So here I've binarized the output, right? These are, these are now true false values where yellow represent the great players and blue represent uh, the not great players. Uh, and I only have uh, uh, 20 data points instead of several hundred. Um, because I'm gonna manually run through the SUD process. And what I was hoping to do here uh, was to uh, do some beautiful uh, graphics animation in the style of three blue, one brown. Anybody know the, uh, the YouTuber three blue, one brown? 
If you don't, and you have any questions about math, go look him up. The uh, guy's name is Grant, uh, Grant Sanderson, and he, uh, he's amazing. And he gave him permission to adapt his code for this project, but I threw my back out last week, so I spent most of the last week lying on the couch. So all I had was my iPad and my pen, so you're gonna see some scribble animation uh, for, for how this works. And so uh, I think it gets the point across, although it's not as beautiful. Uh, so uh, what happens with SUD, right? So first we pick some random decision boundary, right? And so I draw that random decision boundary, and then we start measuring the mistakes. Right? And that means drawing a perpendicular line from each data point onto, uh, onto the decision boundary. And so the yellow points are good, are good players. And so if they're on the left, they are correct answers. And if they're on the right, they're wrong answers. So I'm drawing the correct answers in green and the wrong answers in red. Right? Now we repeat that process, but uh, the other way around for the blue dots. And so we measure the distance from each of these points to the decision boundary, color-coded. And now each of, these is, each of these points is gonna be pushing or pulling on that decision boundary to adjust it in the right direction. Now we adjust the strength of these things. The long green lines represent cases where the model made the correct prediction confidently, right? And so those ones don't count for very much. So we're gonna kind of gray those out because um, they're, uh, they don't mean much. Um, but the longer red lines are the important ones, right? Those are the ones where the model made the wrong answer, like a really wrong answer. So we're gonna make those red lines, uh, especially the longer ones, a lot thicker, right? Now each of these is gonna start pushing or pulling on the decision plane, right? And so the, lo the, uh, the longer the red line, the harder it's going to pull the decision boundary in that direction, right? So those red lines we are springs that are pulling decision boundary in that direction and uh, the green lines are, are pushing, uh, and the, uh, all this has the effect of tweaking the decision boundary over uh, to be slightly different. I'm gonna take some learning rate size step, uh, and uh, I, uh, I had to go back and, and redo it a couple times, but then you repeat the process and you take another step. Right? So this, this is what SGD looks like. In a, in a very real sense, I can think of it as kind of a force model, right? where each of the data points is pushing and pulling on the decision boundary. And for a linear model, that decision boundary is just a line, so you can kind of reason pretty easily uh, about what it looks like. Uh, yes, thank you, you don't need to play again. Thank you very much. Moving on, right? And so it's the loss function is the thing that converts the length of that line into the strength of the spring, right? So L2 is squaring a number to figure out how strong this, the uh, spring should be pushing, and L1 is just taking the value of it. And uh, the logistic loss uh, converts that zero to one to a minus infinity to infinity, depending on uh, how confident it is. So that's, that's what the different loss functions are, uh, are actually doing, is converting that length into the spring force. All right, so that's one view, that's one visual view of what uh, the learning process is doing, what SGD is doing. There's another view, uh, which is, uh, uh, just as important and uh, uh, useful for reasoning about, uh, about neural networks, which is the shape of the loss surface. So the loss number that people talk about is the sum of all of the strengths of those springs that are pushing and pulling. It's the sum of all the mistake values, right? And uh, horizontally, we're plotting the parameter values. And so for a linear model, there's only two. There's the angle and there's the position, right? And I'm gonna simplify that here and say the angle's the more important one, and so we're just gonna plot a single value horizontally which represents the angle. So when you plot the loss versus the angle, you get this nice, smooth parabolic curve. And this smoothness is an intrinsic property of linear models. They always have these smooth, convex loss surfaces where there's a very well-defined bottom that's algorithmically fairly easy to get to. Now, the whole shape of the surface is extremely uh, computationally intensive, right? You're, you're never gonna plot this whole surface pretty much because it's very, very expensive because every point on that requires going through your whole data set, right? And uh, so what you do is you start with one, some random point, right? You measure the loss value, and actually because you're doing a mini batch, you're gonna get it wrong. You're gonna be off this uh, up or down a little bit. Then you use calculus to figure out the gradient, the derivative, the slope of that line, right? And you see that it gets better, it goes down when you move to the right. And then you can trace out a few points um, and you start to see the shape of the line and you hopefully get to the bottom and you get pretty near uh, the ideal model. 
All right, so this is, this is the shape of the loss surface versus the parameters for a linear model. And this is greatly simplified with only a single parameter on the bottom, right? You can imagine uh, a, a more complex linear model that has many different parameters where the bottom is uh, a surface or a cube or a thousand dimensional space where there's still some height above it you're trying to find your way down. But it's always this nice smooth thing in a linear model, which is what's called convex optimization. It has a bunch of great mathematical properties. Um, and linear models uh, have a lot of great things going for them. They work well in non-GPU environments, which are super common. Uh, convergence is reliable because there, there's always only one way down. Um, there's not a lot of hyperparameters to tweak. Uh, and, uh, so, and they're also kind of intrinsically interpretable. You can look at the slope of the uh, loss function with respect to uh, each of these values and you kind of understand how important each feature is. Um, but it requires manual feature engineering. It requires uh, working with the data to find any interactions or anything, um, uh, any complexity beyond a, a simple linear uh, arrangement. Okay, so that's background on linear models and kind of the basics. What about neural networks? All right, so in contrast, uh, neural networks have non-convex optimization. You don't have these nice smooth surfaces. You really need a GPU to do anything, which, you know, they're getting easier to come by, but uh, they're, they're still not ubiquitous. Um, they're often quite difficult to train because they have tons of different hyperparameters, knobs that you can tweak to change the training process. Uh, and if you don't get them uh, pretty good, uh, then you're going to get a, a really bad model. They're super hard to interpret, kind of notoriously so. They're techniques, but they don't always work. Um, but on the plus side, they automatically explore tons and tons of different options for how the data might be interacting. Uh, and... Uh, uh, and this leads to amazing results, as you can see in some, some modern AI. Um, so, uh, uh, so practically speaking, when it comes to choosing a, a machine learning technique, uh, you need to consider a bunch of things. One of them is the algorithm itself, like the, the research behind the technique and what it's fundamentally capable of. But you also need to think about the quality of the tooling, the software that's available, the libraries, uh, how good it is, and how easy these things are to use. Is it something that one person has gotten to use once, or are there tons of, uh, tons of people saying this is reliable? And a lot of that is related to how much collective understanding there is in the world about how to use it, how many Stack Overflow posts, how many blog posts. And that's part of why we're here, is to, to kind of teach each other some best practices and make the, uh, the more advanced research easier to, uh, to accomplish great results. Um, so, now I'm going to include a little bit of history about how uh, people used to use uh, neural networks or, or used to, to view neural networks and, and uh, some of the optimization problems. And I think a bunch of you here might be thinking, you know, I just want to get results done. I don't really care to hear what people used to think that was wrong. Um, and I totally empathize with that. And I, I debated putting this in, but I, I realized that if you are familiar with the latest results and, and things that uh, are known to work pretty well, you're likely to work, be working in a team with people who are not familiar with these results. So the more that you are on top of things, the more that you're going to have to be able to explain to your peers uh, why the things that they thought about these techniques might not be correct anymore. And that means understanding their, uh, uh, the way people used to look at these things. Uh, so. Uh, with that said, let's talk about non-convex optimization. So this used to be one of the key reasons why people were scared of neural networks. Convex surfaces on the, on the left, linear models, they're clean, they're simple, you know you can get to the bottom of that curve, right? You know that you will be able to find that point down there. Uh, on the right is the picture of an actual loss surface of a ResNet. Uh, and you can see it's got all this weird shape and structure. And you imagine a ball rolling downhill on this thing. Uh, it's probably going to land in, in one of these little local minima and not find its way down to the bottom where you want it to, right? Uh, so this is why uh, people have been scared, uh, one of the reasons people, people were scared of, uh, of neural nets for a very long time. Uh, but there's some recent research that puts this, uh, this kind of intuitive view into a very different light, and we're going to go through that. So this is the lost surface view. Jumping back to the decision plane view of your data, uh, so we knew uh, the linear model is just going to draw a single line through this, and uh, that's your model, right? What's a neural network going to do? 
it can do stuff that's way cooler, way more complex, right? So very literally, every neuron in a neural network is a linear model. Every neuron is a logistic regression model. So I've drawn one, two, three, four, five, six of these things on the, uh, on the plane. And so every neuron is drawing a new decision boundary. And look at this. Look how awesome this is. I got every single data point on there. Every, every orange point is to the left, and every blue point is to the right, except for that one there, which is good, because you don't want to overfit, right? Do you think this is overfitting? Yeah, OK, I kid. Right, this is obviously a horrible model, but um, this shows you what is going on in terms of, uh, well, the first layer of a neural network. And the second layer uh, is, uh, I'm not even sure what it, uh, what it would look like. Uh, because each of the, these distances become features for a, a subsequent set of, uh, of linear models. Um, uh, but the, the, idea, uh, the original idea still holds that each of these data points is going to be pushing and pulling on every one of those decision planes uh, and trying to move the decision boundary around. And you can see the, a neural network gives you an arbitrarily complex decision boundary. And there's obviously good and bad points to it, right? You, you come up with this model, it's going to do great on your training data and, and absolutely horribly on, your, uh, on any test data. OK, so here is uh, a set of research uh, which I think is the most important thing to understanding training neural networks in, in recent years. It was rediscovered just a few years ago, um, but it was actually first pr uh, proposed by uh, Hockreiter and, and uh, Schmid, uh, Schmid Huber back in 1997. And it's the idea of uh, sharp minima uh, uh, versus uh, wide minima. So to visualize this, I've got another series of paintings for you. Let's see if we can get this one to work. Uh, so imagine you have a loss surface with two, uh, two minima, and they both go down to the same point. Right? They're both the same level. Uh, pardon my drawing if it's not exact. Uh, but, uh, and so there's two, uh, two potential neural networks. Now, you might think that they are the same quality because they both get the same loss value, right? Now, this is the training data, right? What you care about is generalization to the test data. So uh, you can imagine that the loss surface for the test data is similar in shape, but maybe shifted over just a little bit, right? Or it's going to be tweaked or, or somehow related, but not exactly lined up, right? Um, and I think this is a pretty good mental model for the difference between, between train and test data when it comes to loss surface. And so what happens is you train a neural network to find, uh, uh, to find this point on parameter space back and forth, and then you found it on this blue loss surface. But then you need to go up to the red loss surface in the test data to see how well this thing generalizes to unseen data. And if you uh, reason through it this way, you can see, are you drawing? Come on, paint. There we go. Um, that, so that's the generalization gap between your train and test data, right? If you find a wide minimum, then it's not very big. But if you find a very broad, uh, sorry, if you find a wide minimum, yeah, it's not very big. But if you find a very sharp minimum, then you can see that just a slight horizontal shift in that loss surface is going to lead to a very large increase in, uh, in error. And so the uh, intuition from this uh, which is backed up by, by more and more evidence as, uh, as time goes on, even though this was questioned uh, pretty loudly when it, uh, when it was first rediscovered a few years ago. I, I hope we can... I'm not even going to point to that paper because I think it got way too much attention because I think it's just wrong. They, they ignored some, some basic things. But uh, uh, the intuition is that if you can find a really wide space in the loss surface, this is going to give you better results on your test data. All right, um, please don't play again. Move on. OK, so uh, here's another view on this. So in this paper, um, uh, they took three random initializations and trained three neural nets to convergence. And you can see they got nice. Uh, so we're plotting two parameters here, right? And uh, red represents low loss, and blue is high loss. And so to, to kind of project this in a cartoon onto one dimension, there are these three minima that have these big values uh, uh, between them, right? Uh, so these are three local minima is, is uh, a clearly correct way of looking at this, uh, at this diagram. But what they did then, all right, so, so to explain what's going on with these, these three points. So we're, this is a ResNet. I think this is a, a ResNet 156. So it's got 50 million parameters, right? So how do we draw this on, on 2D? So between any two points, you can connect a line, right? Even in 50, dimensional, 50 million dimensional space. Between any three points, you can draw a plane, right? And so that's what they did. They, they trained three neural networks. 
to find three points in 50 million dimensional space, and they, they drew the plane between those three uh, points and calculated the, the loss at each of those. And that's, that's what they got here, right? This, this clear three pump pattern. Then they abandoned one of them, they abandoned the top one, they kept the, the lower two, and they rotated that plane around through the other 59 million dimensions until they found something that looked like this. Right? They found a way to get from one of those loss, uh, one of those converge points to the other without going uphill at all by staying down at the bottom. Right? So this, this means that these are not actually disconnected local minima. They're all part of the same really, really wide valley. Right? And the, the sharp minima theory says we want to be in the middle there. Right? We want to be uh, in this place where there's, uh, uh, where you can go a long distance in any direction without going uphill. And they showed that this is uh, generally true for a large variety of neural networks and, and uh, um, uh, uh, architectures and data sets and, and what have you. This seems to be generally true that there aren't these local minima that you think of, which are the, these pockets, but everything is connected. Okay, um, so this is confusing, right? Which is it? Uh, this is real data, right? This actually happens. This was actually measured on a ResNet. And we also see data saying that, that it's like this, that there's this big, wide open valley, this, this big lake at the bottom, which is completely flat. And we want to somehow find our way into the middle of that thing. Uh, it turns out these are both correct. And uh, to, to square the circle, you need to recognize that we're dealing with 50 million dimensional geometry, right? We can draw pictures in 1D and 2D and 3D, and that's about it. Reasoning about super high dimensional stuff is really counterintuitive. And, and the way these things can both be simultaneously correct is to, to so think about one of, these, uh, one of these local minima in this lost surface, right? So on this two dimensional plot that we have, it's, it's a bowl, right? Any way you go in those two dimensions is uphill. But there's 59 million other dimensions. And it turns out that one of those is pretty much always gonna be pointing downhill, right? That there aren't, uh, and, and the research seems to, seems to support this pretty conclusively, that there aren't any local minima in neural network loss surfaces. There are plenty of saddle points, where it's places where the gradient goes to zero because it's uphill in some directions and downhill in other directions, but it's completely flat uh, at some point, and that's, that's problematic for STD. But it, it seems like that though both of these are actually correct. There is this big, flat, wide open basin in the middle of the loss surface. Uh, if you can find the right way to represent it. And that's clearly where you want to get to, right? You want to get to the middle of this flat lake. The problem is, how do you do that, right? Because SGD only knows how to go downhill, right? So SGD will walk downhill till it gets to the edge of the lake, and then it might wander into the lake a little bit, but then and maybe it'll bounce out because it's stochastic and it's, it's noisy. But SGD has no gradient pointing it towards the middle of the lake because it's flat. So SGD is probably just going to walk around the edge of the lake and, and never find the middle, never find the point that you want. And my friend Pratik uh, Chowdhury uh, did this research that shows that generally SGD doesn't converge to a point, it converges to a cycle, uh, supporting this, this same idea. And so he tried to combine this with the, uh, with the sharp minimum theory uh, into an algorithm called uh, entropy SGD, um, which deliberately biases SGD both to go downhill but also to go to a place where the curvature is low. Right, and uh, what this looks like, I'm trying to do another uh, a cartoon drawing, is it starts walking and it adds noise. It doesn't just go downhill, but it just bounces off in random directions so that it can measure the curvature uh, in the, the part of the lost surface where it is, and then it biases towards places that are both downhill and flat. Right, and uh, it, so it's a, it's a modification to the SGD process that helps you find a, a wide, a wide minute. There we go. Um, and uh, this sounds great, and it, it's consistent with all the theory, and it, uh, it seems to work great sometimes, but people often have trouble getting it to work, and it's a pretty massive change to your code to implement this algorithm. Uh, so uh, a, an alternative uh, training algorithm that takes advantage of this uh, geometric understanding is uh, this one called uh, stochastic weight averaging. And this one is, is beautiful. Uh, and the intuition behind it is just that if you have a bunch of points around the edge of the lake, if you want to find the point in the middle of the lake, you just take the average of those points around the edge. 
right? So, and, and this is what you do. You just, you let it train for a while till you're walking around the edge. You, you capture those points uh, around the edge of the, the lake and you just take the average of them. Uh, and so they tested this and it seems to work out uh, uh, pretty darn well. Uh, and so uh, here's some, some charts from the paper uh, which actually imply that the bottom isn't completely flat, but kind of bumpy as well. And, and again, all of these interpretations can be simultaneously correct in multi-million dimensional geometry. Um, all right, so this is, this is complicated. Uh, there's a bunch of deep theory stuff. How can I actually use this, right? This is what you're thinking, like, okay, can we bounce back to reality now? Uh, so uh, I'll show you. If you're lucky enough to be working in PyTorch, uh, then this is what your optimization loop uh, probably looks like, right? You instantiate your optimizer, uh, you go through some iteration where you calculate the loss function, you do a step on, uh, on the optimizer. If you wanna add ST, uh, SWA into this, it's two lines of code, two extra lines of code and renaming a variable. All right, all you have to do is, in, after you instantiate your first uh, optimizer, SGD or whatever, you pass that thing in, base opt, into, as a parameter to the SWA optimizer, let the thing run just like normal. You don't change a single line of code in your, your complex training code. And then at the end, you just say, okay, SWA, average it. Find me in the middle of the lake. Uh, and to give you a sense of what that looks like if you're not using PyTorch and you have to actually implement the algorithm yourself, imagine your code looks like this, where you instantiate a trainer and you let the thing run for 100 epochs and then you get the model out uh, at the end, uh, adding SWA would just look like this. You let it run for a while, 75 epochs, and then you start collecting a list of checkpoints. And then you let it run for a while some more, periodically grabbing the model out of the trainer, putting it into your list of checkpoints. And then when you've done that, you just take the average of those checkpoints to get your final model. Right, and, and it, I just want to uh, jump back to how counterintuitive this is, right? So you look at this and you say, okay, here's three point, here's three models. If I take the average of them, it's gonna put me right there. It's gonna put me on this ridiculously high point on the loss surface, right? It's gonna give me a crappy, crappy model if I just average a bunch of models that are trained independently. And that's true if they're trained independently, right? These were trained from different random inits. But uh, if, you, uh, if you follow these heuristics, if you let it train just about to convergence and then you let it keep going at a reasonably high learning rate, then it tends to form one of these limit cycles where it's walking around the, the edge of some big flat plane and you can just average those things and get to the middle of something flat, which tends to generalize uh, much better. And so with a few lines of code, you can implement the result of many years of mind-numbing math and take advantage of it to just get uh, uh, better results uh, in your code. Uh, and that uh, is the end of this talk. Uh, so I'll well, thank you. And here's a list of uh, references to, uh, uh, to papers on the topic um, and some people that, uh, whose work I follow in this space that I think is really good. And I'll happily take uh, any questions you have. Yeah, uh, okay. They are not this, they're, they're not the same data set, they're different researchers. They're actually both ResNet um, to the same model class. They might even be, I think they might even be using CIFAR, uh, uh, both using CIFAR 100 or, or, because it's, it's pretty common. Um, they very well might be representing the exact same thing. Okay, so here's where I thought I followed up until this point. You took one on the left and you dropped one of them, which to me looks like taking the derivative. Uh, no, okay, so when it, when, we, when it dropped one of them, uh, uh, I'm going walking around the lake. Uh, here, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, the first, this first one is just showing you, uh, giving you, a, a kind of confirming the standard intuition that there are local minima in, uh, in a neural network loss zone. Right? and showing that if you find three points in, uh, uh, in the parameter space by starting with different random minutes, uh, and if you do this experiment by plotting this plane through those three points and measuring the, the wave, it looks like this, like you would expect. There's three disconnected minima where you have to go way uphill to get between them. Right? And then they dropped the, uh, they, they ignored this one, 
And, but they kept these two, and they said, okay, if these are the only two that we're working with, is there some path, is there some planar path that we can walk along where we can get from, one, from this one to this one without having to go uphill at all? And they, that's what they found, right? They found this valley that they can walk through, uh, which, is, which is a different plane, completely unrelated, uh, where they can get from one to the other. So I, I mean, one of the things that's confusing about these high dimensional uh, um, spaces is that any picture you draw is kind of like an experiment, right? The, the underlying concept is so vast and confusing that every visualization uh, is just some narrow window onto the underlying truth. Right, so, so that's the right way to look at all of these diagrams, is they're all just kind of very limited views of some much bigger, more complex thing that's, uh, that's hard to understand.